Welcome. In this video, we're going to implement some basic set theoretic definitions in Haskell. So first, we're going to write our own data type for sets, and then we'll write functions which check whether a given element is part of a set, whether a set is a subset of another set, and finally, we'll be writing some functions which do basic set theoretic operations like unions and intersections. Like the previous video, I'll always first describe what we're trying to do and give you some time to think about it for yourself and try to write your own implementation. After that, I'm going to give you my version of the function and explain why it works. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define a new data type for sets. And in order for you to understand this definition, I need to maybe build up to it a bit. So remember that in the last video, we defined a new type for Booleans which was called coolbool, and its definition looked like this. So it was uh, either nope or yup. And here I'm also deriving show so that I can print uh, this type to the console. So recall that here we use the data keyword to uh, define a new type. And the thing next to data here is the name of the new type. So in this case, it's coolbool. And then we write an equal sign. And to the right of the equal sign, we put the constructors for this data type. So in this case, coolbool has two constructors separated by this vertical line here, which means that we can use either the first one or the second one to construct elements of the type. In this case, these constructors were called nope and yup, and they don't have any arguments. So basically, they're just constants. If I now open a new integrated terminal here at the folder my script is in, run ghci and load the script with colon l. So the script is called sets then I can actually check whether my definition here works. So I can type in nope. So that's the name of this constructor and it'll print nope. So there's no error, which is good. If I check the type of nope, you see it's of type coolbool. Okay, so this is perhaps the simplest way to define a new type. You just give it a bunch of constructors which don't have any fields or don't take any arguments. A more sophisticated way of defining types is including fields in your constructors. So here I'm going to define a type for rectangles. So it'll be called rectangle and have a single constructor also called rectangle. And rectangle will take two arguments, which will be of type double. And again, I'm going to derive show. So here the idea is I want to represent rectangles. And so one way to do this would be to well have two numbers, namely the width and the height of the rectangle. And so this would uh, yeah, describe a rectangle with width and height, which are doubles. Now again, the thing here on the left is the name of the type whereas the thing here on the right is the name of the constructor for the type. Here, the, they actually have the same name, which is OK, and it's probably even a good idea to do in most cases so that you don't have to like remember uh, various names which uh, aren't necessarily related. Now, in contrast to coolbool up here, this rectangle constructor takes two arguments, which are both of type double, so basically, this is saying you give this constructor two doubles and it constructs an element of uh, type rectangle. And like when you're uh, defining functions, the way to put arguments after the function is just separated by spaces. OK, so let's save our script here and reload it and construct a rectangle. So in order to well construct a rectangle, I type in rectangle. That's the name of the constructor. And now I need to supply it with two doubles, for example, 3.0 and 4.0. And that will give me a rectangle with width 3 and height 4. Uh, I can now check uh, that the type of this thing is actually of type rectangle. So you see that that's indeed the case. On the other hand, this object is maybe a bit limited because in order to construct something of type rectangle, I actually have to give it doubles in the fields. And I can't actually give it anything else that will result in an error. To see this is the case, let me try to construct a rectangle which uh, I don't know, has, let's say, 3.0 of type float and, let's say, 4.0 of type float. So if I would somehow try to create a rectangle which has floats as side links, you see here I get an, an error. And it says that it couldn't match the expected type double with the actual type, which is float. So I can't use this definition of a type to construct uh, rectangles which have width and height that are floats. This is similar to the problem we have when we're defining function signatures. So there also, you can either use 
concrete types, but then you can only use the function on those specific concrete types you used in the definition. On the other hand, we saw that for function signatures, we can use type variables to range over uh, many possible types. So there you had like a type variable A, which represented an arbitrary type. And in fact, you can do the same thing when you're defining a new data types. So let's define rectangle uh, prime here, but it's going to have a type variable A as an additional argument. So this is saying that for each type A, I'm going to define a type of rectangle primes for that type. And its definition will be similar. So it'll be uh, have a constructor, which is again called rectangle prime, but it'll have two fields, which are just both A. So again, for each type A, we have uh, such a type rectangle prime A. And what does it consist of? Well, it consists of this constructor rectangle prime with two fields that are both of type A. If I save and reload, we can test out uh, rectangle prime. So if I try to now construct a rectangle prime with, let's say, 3.0 of type float and uh, 2.0 of type float like this, then we see that this indeed works. And if you check the type of this object, so I uh, do colon T uh, before the object, I see that this uh, object is of type rectangle prime float. So in this concrete case, it has been instantiated using float. So rectangle prime A here has been concretely instantiated using a float. In a similar fashion, I can now actually create rectangles which have any sort of width and height. So I could even create a rectangle which has width true and height false. Um, so that works. And this would be an object of rectangle prime bool. So in this case, the A I'm supplying is, is bool. Now in this case, probably creating rectangles which have Boolean heights and widths doesn't make so much sense. But maybe actually it would make sense to like have strings. So I could have like a rectangle which has like height or width five and uh, something like this. So six like that, that also works. And this is now an object of rectangle prime string. Okay, so I'm hoping you're seeing the, the pattern here. So this is going from sort of very uh, basic to more general. So in the basic case, we have constructors which have no fields. Then in the more um, advanced case, we have constructors which have fields, but the fields contain concrete types like double here. And in the most abstract case, we actually uh, parameterize our type by a type variable or multiple type variables if you wanted to. And in this case, we can now use this type variable that we're giving in the definition of the type in order to say what uh, the fields are. So here, rectangle prime has two fields of type A. So the only restriction here is that these two fields have to be of the same type, but they can be of any type. And for each type A, we get a new type of rectangle primes over that type. Okay, so this now brings me to the definition of sets, which I've now built up to. The reason is that sets will also um, contain this type parameter A. So we're going to define a new data type called set A, and it will have a single constructor called set. And the field for this constructor will be a list of A's. And I'm again going to derive show that I can print this to the console. So if I reload my script, I can now try to construct an object of type set. So here I need to provide the constructor with a list of A's. For instance, I could uh, supply it with a list of Booleans like this. So true and false, okay? And this will create now a, an object which has uh, the name set and then followed by, well, the list that I supplied. If I now check the, the type of this, we'll see that um, this is a set bool, which means it's a set containing uh, elements of type bool. And that's because here the list I gave set was a list of booleans. So A here has been concretely instantiated as bool. On the other hand, I could uh, add different things here into this list. For instance, I could add, let's say, some integers. So I have like one of type int and two of type int occurring in this list. And you see that in this case, this will be a set int, which means it's a set containing integers. In other words, what we're doing here in this definition is for each type A, we're defining a new type of sets which contains elements of that type. And what is such a set? Well, basically, it's just a list of A's 
um, preceded by the constructor name set. So kind of we've just packed a list of A's into a set by adding this uh, name set in front of the list. Okay, so I hope now that with building up through these uh, examples here of cool bool and rectangle, um, this definition of sets is not altogether mysterious. I'm now going to delete those because they're not uh, relevant for what we're doing in this video. So now that we have this data type for sets, we can now uh, basically uh, start writing functions that act on this new data type. The first two functions we'll write are conversion functions, which allow us to convert a set into its underlying list and also convert a given list into a set. The first function here I'm going to call unset. So it's going to be a function which takes a set of A's and produces its underlying list, which is a list of A's. And now I could uh, let you try to implement this on your own, but in fact, you haven't really uh, seen an example yet how you would uh, go about unpacking an object of type set. So here I'll just give this as an example. So basically we can use pattern matching here um, to get the underlying list of a set as follows. So the function unset will be defined as follows. We have unset, and then I'm going to pattern match the argument, which is of type set A, as follows. So I'm going to write set x's here in brackets. And the definition for this function is just going to be that I want to just return the x's. Okay, so I'm going to now explain exactly what is happening here. So um, this is a function that takes uh, an element of type set A, and it should return its underlying list. Now, because of the definition for sets up here, we know that each element of type set A is actually of the form, well, it has the name set as the constructor, and then it's followed by some list of A's. And that's what I'm pattern matching here. So basically, I'm unpacking this uh, given set, which I'm handed as an argument. I'm saying, okay, it's going to be of the form set, followed by some list of A's, and I'm calling the list of A's X's in this case. So the X's here are actually what I'm interested in, so I'm just going to also just return that list of A's X's. So maybe this will become clearer if I uh, demonstrate how this function works. So if we unset, uh, let's say set uh, with the numbers 1, 2, 3, okay, so that'll just return uh, the list with 1, 2, 3. So you can now see that here in this, uh, the argument I'm supplying is basically of this form, right? It has first the name set, and then it has a list. And if I pattern match this, the X's will be matched against uh, this list here. This example might also give you a bit more insight on how pattern matching actually works in the background. So each uh, type basically has some constructor, which constructs the type out of more basic parts and pattern matching somehow unpacks those constructors. So because we know that the type is constructed using these, these constructors, we can now, well, give the name of the constructor and then the fields of the constructor and match those individual fields to certain variables. Okay, let's uh, now move on to the second conversion function, which will be called toSet. And the idea will be that we'll take a list of A's and convert it into a set um, of type A. So now when we are given a set to get its underlying list is fairly simple. We just want to kind of get rid of the set constructor and we can do that by unpacking it like I just showed you. However, going in the other direction, we kind of want to do some additional stuff. So when we're given a list of A's, we want to remove all duplicate elements when we convert it into a set. So remember that in a set, we don't distinguish between uh, multiple occurrences of the same element. And therefore, if we want to represent a list as a set, it would be good if we got rid of all of the duplicate elements in the list. Now, in order to do this, there's a handy function called nub, but it's not in the standard library. So I need to import data.list. So this is a uh, library part that has useful functions for lists, including this function called nub. So let's save here. The problem now is going to be that this script won't compile because I've just given this type signature. So I'm going to comment it out for the moment. So I'll uh, uh, save the script and reload it. And now I can demonstrate nub. So nub, uh, N-U-B, is a function which takes a list and removes all duplicates. So let's say I have like two occurrences of four in this list here. 
that nub will get rid of the, the occurrence here. And similarly, like if I put like two here at the front, you see uh, nub gets rid of this, this two here. So based on these examples, you can see that nub always keeps the first occurrence and gets rid of the, the remaining occurrences of the element occurring in the list. As such, nub gives us a way to reduce a list that may have multiple like occurrences of elements into a list which just contains uh, single occurrences. And that's basically what we want then to use to convert to a set. Okay, so now uncomment this again here because we want to actually write uh, this function. So if you want, you can now uh, think about how you would use nub um, to construct from a list that you're given to construct a set based on that list, which doesn't contain any multiple elements. Okay, so I hope you've uh, tried this out on your own. I'm now going to uh, proceed to the solution. So to set will take one argument, which is a list, which I'll call x's. And well, now we want to construct a set based on this list, but we want to get rid of all the duplicate elements. So to get rid of the duplicate elements, I can do nub x's, right, with the nub function. And then I want to, well, create a set based on this new list uh, nub x's. Okay, so basically there's uh, two things happening here. So I'm taking this list, then I'm first computing the nub of it. So I'm removing all duplicates and then I'm constructing a new set based on this reduced list. And uh, to construct the set, you just use the set constructor followed by the list you want to use to construct the set, which is what's happening in brackets here. Now you can see nub is underlined in red. And if I scroll down, I can see that uh, it's complaining that it wants to have A that I'm using in my type signature here be of type class ek. So this makes sense because, uh, well, in order to like remove all duplicates from a list, you need to be able to compare them using equality. So you need to check whether like two elements are equal in order to know whether like they're duplicate or not. So nub will uh, require uh, these elements of type A to be of type class ek. Okay, but once I add this additional type class constraint here, the function uh, is fine. I can now reload and test it. So let's say I want to do, I want to make a set out of uh, this list here, which doesn't contain any duplicates. So I just get as a return value set one, two, three. However, if my original list did contain duplicates, so let, let's say I have two occurrences of one, and then I have like a several occurrences of two, then you see I get the same set, the set containing one, two, and three, even if I have like a longer list which contain duplicate elements. Okay, so we now have two functions, one which converts sets into their underlying list, and another one which takes a list and converts it to a set while removing duplicates. Now as a challenge, you can also think about how you would implement nub on your own. Um, however, in this case, it's already an existing function in data.list and probably the implementation in uh, that's given there is pretty efficient, so it doesn't really make sense to redefine it. All right, let's move on to the next topic, which is we want to check um, whether a given uh, object is an element of a set. So we want to check whether um, x is an element um, of a set. Okay, so we'd like to write a function which takes some uh, element of type A and checks whether it's contained in a set of type A. Now, um, I suggest you try to do this on your own. My hint is that you can use the pre-existing functions for lists, um, and there we had a function, lm, which checked whether a given uh, element was contained in a list. And so you can use this pre-existing function, lm, in combination with either uh, unpacking the, the set that uh, you want to check whether the element is contained in using pattern matching, or you could also use the unset function here to do that uh, task. So basically the idea is you reduce the set to a list and then you use lm to check whether the element is contained in the list. Okay, so I hope you've uh, spent some time trying to figure this out on your own. I'm now going to proceed to um, two possible solutions. I'm going to call this function inset. Okay, so inset will be a function which takes an element of type A together with a set of A's and returns a Boolean like this. Now what will inset do? 
Well, I'm first going to define inset using our existing function unset. So inset here will take, well, it'll take an x and it'll take a set, which maybe I call s, okay? So inset x s will be, well, I'm going to check whether x, so this element I'm interested in, is actually an element of the underlying list of s. So I'm going to write x lm unset um, s like so. Now you see that the lm is underlined in red. Why is this? Well, it's again complaining that I need to add the type constraint ek a to my function signature. Why is this? Because lm needs, uh, well, equality in order to compare x with the elements of the list s. Okay, so this gives us one way to define this inset function. Basically, we're just using lm to check whether x is contained in the underlying list of s. And the way to get the underlying list in this case, we're using our unset function. So we're unsetting s to get a list, and then we can use these list functions. Let's check whether this actually works by saving and reloading our script. So let's check, for instance, whether it's true that inset3 is, uh, well, in the set containing 1, 2, and 3. And indeed, this is true. Whereas if I remove 3 and put 4, you see I get false. Now, an alternative version of inset, which I'll call inset prime, would use pattern matching to get the underlying list. So basically, we're kind of not using the existing function unset there. So in this case, the function definition would be inset prime x. And now, instead of just giving the set, I'm handing this function the name s, I'm going to pattern match it. So I'm going to call it set, and then I'll maybe say it's set y's. So x is an element of type A, and well, this thing will pattern match to the set I'm handing, right? And y's will then pattern match to the underlying list of that set in question. So that's exactly the same as in the case above here in the unset function. So this pattern here matches the variable x's to the underlying list of the set I'm handing it. Okay, and now I can just use the list y's in my function definition, so I can directly write um, x uh, lm y's, like so. So this also gives me a valid uh, version of checking whether an element is part of a set. So the difference here is that somehow here I'm not unpacking the set in question, and then in the function definition I'm using unset to unpack it, whereas here I'm doing the unpacking by a pattern matching directly, and then I can use the, the list in question there. Personally, I don't have a strong preference for either of these versions. They're both basically the same level of complexity here. You have to understand the pattern matching, and here you're using an existing function, which you have to understand what it does. But basically, this existing function just uses the, the pattern matching anyway, so mm, these function definitions are more or less equivalent. OK, so now that we have a way of checking whether a given element is contained in a set or not, we can now also check whether a given set is a subset of another set. So that will be our next task. So check if one set is a subset um, of another. Remember that one set is a subset of another if every element in the first set is contained in the second set. So basically, instead of just checking whether one element, like x, is contained in a given set, we need to check whether all the elements contained in the first set are contained in the second set. So here there are um, several ways we can uh, approach this task. So perhaps the most basic way in terms of like using uh, existing functions would be to use recursion. So there's some recursive definition you could make. But this is probably the uh, more difficult version to think about because you have to understand uh, yeah, recursion in order to do this. An easier way is actually to use the uh, existing function AND together with list comprehension. So remember that AND is a function which takes a list of Booleans and checks whether each value in that list is true. This, in fact, gives you a way to more or less directly write down the math definition for subsets. So for each element in the first set, you check whether it's contained in the second. And this will give you a list of Booleans. And then you can use AND to see whether, well, all of those Boolean values are true, in which case all of the elements of the first set are contained in the second. And uh, therefore, the first set is a subset of the second set. 
So I think this uh, second version is probably the, the easiest to think about because it's close to the uh, math definition. And finally, you could also use all uh, together with list comprehension. And uh, here, all, remember, is a function that's a bit more fancy and complicated than and. So it takes a predicate. So that's a function which takes some uh, element of type A and produces a bool. And then it also takes a list of A's and it checks whether all of the elements in that list satisfy the predicate. So here the predicate you would be using is, well, whether you know the element is actually contained in the second set. And the list of A's you would be checking this against is the list of elements in the first set. But yeah, this one is basically just a fancier version of the first implementation. And so, uh, yeah, if you manage to write down the first implementation, you can also think about whether you can somehow manage to do this using all. In any case, in either of these definitions, so in all three versions, you'll be using the inset function uh, to check whether, well, a given element is part of the second set. And we just need to somehow do this for all the elements in the first set we're given. So I now suggest that you try on your own to write uh, one version of a function that checks whether a given set is a subset of another. And if you're feeling confident, you can also try to find all of these three uh, versions I'm talking about. I'll now move on to, uh, well, showing you the solution. So let's start with the, the first one, which is I'll just call subset like this. And here I'm going to use uh, the recursive definition, which maybe isn't the most easy to understand, but it's somehow the most basic in terms of the operations you're actually performing when executing the function. So subset should take, well, it's going to take an element of set A, it's going to take a second element of set A, and it's going to produce a Boolean. So it's going to tell us whether the first set is contained in the second. And now because we're going to be using inset in our function definition, we also need to have a be of the ec type class because we need to be able to check, well, whether these elements are actually, well, equal to one another or not. Okay, so for this recursive function definition, I need to somehow define a base case. And the base case when we're dealing with lists was often the empty list. And here, when we're dealing with sets, the base case will often be something to do with empty sets. So how do I uh, check whether I have an empty set? Well, the empty set will just be the set corresponding to the empty list. So it'll be like the empty list packed in the set constructor. So I'm now saying, okay, the first element will be of this form. So it's going to be the empty set. And the second element is going to be, well, it's going to be an arbitrary set. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is because in any case, if I have the empty set, uh, the empty set will be a subset of any other set. Okay, so this first case is like the base case. I'm saying that if I'm handed the empty set as the first argument, so this I'm pattern matching this like so, and any other set as a second argument, then I return true because the empty set is a subset of any other set. So the reason for this is that if you um, check whether all the elements in the empty set are contained in the other set, well, that's the case because the empty set doesn't even have any elements in it. Okay. We now move on to the, well, the interesting part, which is not the base case. So here I need to think about what uh, the, the sort of uh, pattern will be that I'm matching. So the pattern I'll be matching is in fact this one here. So if the set I'm handed is not the empty set, then the list that is underlying the set will actually be of this form. So it will contain like a head element X and some other uh, elements, x's, which could potentially be the empty list. So remember from pattern matching lists, this pattern here, yeah, will map, well, the first element of the list to x and all the remaining elements, so the list containing the remaining elements will map to the x's. And so here I'm kind of like unpacking two levels of the object in question. So I'm unpacking this set constructor. So I'm pattern matching that. And then I'm saying, okay, the second, the field in set will be like some list. And I can now further unpack that list uh, using this pattern here. Uh, on the other hand here, I'm just leaving T. I'm just calling the second set, which I'm giving this function as an argument T. 
Now, what should the recursive definition for a subset be? Well, I now I know that uh, this set has at least one element x, and I know that the remaining elements of the set are here represented by the x's. So if this set is going to be a subset of this set, well then on the one hand, x needs to be an element of t, right? Because every element of this set needs to be contained in t. And also, well, the remaining elements here, these x's, also all need to be contained in t. So I'm going to first check whether, well, x is an element of t. And for this, I'm going to use the inset function using uh, infix no uh, notation here. So I'm going to check first whether x is inset t. So that needs to be the case in order for the first set to be a subset of the second. And also, well, I need that the, well, the set um, here that contains the remaining elements, so these x's, also needs to be a subset of t. So I need also that the subset of, well, the set that I build using these x's, I need that to be a subset of t. So here the second part is maybe a bit confusing. Perhaps I should write it using infix notation to make things clearer. So I want the set built based on the x's uh, to be a subset of this set t. And here now it's saying that these brackets are actually unnecessary. So I need to pack x back into a set basically in order to use this subset function. So this x's at the moment are just a list. Now if I apply the, the set constructor, this becomes a set. And so I can actually apply recursively this subset function in order to check whether the remainder is a subset of t. Okay, and the reason this recursion works is because the x's are a strictly shorter list than this list that was in the original set. So eventually I'll land in this base case here where actually the x's are just the empty list. And I know that that is uh, supposed to return true. Okay, so let's save that and reload so that we can uh, check out an example. So let's say we want to test subset set containing uh, one, two, three like this uh, is well contained in set uh, containing uh, three, four, five. So that should return false. But if I now add one, two, three to the beginning of the set, uh, then it's actually true because every element of this list is actually also contained here. Now the subset function shouldn't uh, respect duplicates. So if I have like two elements here, this should also return true, right? Like uh, basically I have like two occurrences of three here, but this is still a subset of this, even though this list isn't contained in this list. So this should even work if I add like insanely many copies of three, you still get true. And this is because every element here, well, is contained in the set that's generated by these, uh, by this list there, even though Again, this list isn't actually like part of this list. All right, so this uh, seems to be working. Um, as I said before, this recursive definition probably isn't the easiest to understand. So I suggest you maybe think a bit about it, but if it uh, seems confusing, don't worry about it. The second definition here will be much more straightforward. So let's move on to that. So subset prime is going to have the same type signature as the original subset function, but I'm going to now use uh, and to define this. And here it'll actually be a one line definition because I don't have to distinguish cases. So subset prime of, well, these two sets in question. So let's call these uh, maybe S and T again, okay? So it's going to equal, so now I need to uh, come up with a list comprehension which generates a list of Booleans which corresponds to whether every element of like S is also contained in T. So I want to check basically something for every element in S. So here I want to range in my list comprehension over the elements of S. But now for a list comprehension, remember that here I need to like add a specific list which the uh, elements in the list comprehension can range over. And so if I just like would say, okay, I want to range over all X in S, this wouldn't work because S itself is not a list. Rather, I need to change uh, S into a list first by using the unset function. So here I'm now ranging over all the elements in S, but I need to first convert it into a list by using unset. Okay, now what am I doing for each X in the set S? Well, I'm checking whether X is actually inset uh, T. Okay, so here each uh, X 
is checked whether it's in t, and I'm creating a list of all the Boolean values that result. So for each x, I get one Boolean value, which says whether it's contained in t or not. And now here we see things are uh, complaining because the types don't match. So the thing I've defined at the moment is now a big list of Boolean values, but actually I just want to return a single Boolean. And well, the single Boolean I want to return is true if actually all of the elements of this list here are true. So I'm going to use and to, to do that. Okay, so that gives me my uh, definition here of the function. So I'm basically looping through all elements in the first set here by, well, doing a list comprehension where I'm ranging over unset s. And then for each element, I'm checking whether it's in the set t. And if this is the case for all elements, so that's what and is doing here, then I return true and otherwise I return false. So let's reload and uh, make sure that this function works. So I'll uh, do this uh, last function call, but now in this case with subset prime, just to uh, show you that it also returns true. And here I hope that uh, this definition is easier to understand than the first. So basically it's very close to the math definition. So we're basically saying that, well, S is a subset of T if for all X in S, so the and is like acting like a for all. And then here this thing, so the X's are ranging over elements of S. So this is like saying for all X in S, we want that uh, X is in set T or basically X is an element of T. So that's what the math definition says. Okay, I'll now give you the final version of um, subset. So subset double prime, uh, again, it'll have the same type signature, but this time I'm gonna use the function all. So subset double prime um, st, it's going to be very similar to the, the previous definition, but I'm just going to use all. So remember that the type signature of all is the following. So it basically takes a predicate. So it needs to take a function, which takes an a and returns a bool. Then it needs to take some type of list of a's. So the function is actually defined more generally to take a foldable, but you can think of this t a just as being a list of a's. And uh, then it returns a bool. So it takes a predicate and a list of a's and returns a bool. And that bool will be true precisely when all of the elements of that list satisfy the predicate. So now I need to come up with a suitable predicate. And for the moment, I'm going to uh, write a anonymous function to do this. So the predicate I want, so lambda x, so x maps to what? Well, I want to check whether x is actually inset uh, t, okay? So this function just takes an element x and checks whether x is in the set t. And now what is the list of elements I want to check this for? Well, it's the underlying list of the first set. So it's again going to be unset um, s. And here I need to surround these by uh, parentheses so that uh, all actually has uh, knows like which ones are the arguments. So the first argument of all is this predicate. So it checks for any x you give it, it checks whether x is in the set t. And here the second argument is, well, what uh, elements am I checking this for? Well, I'm checking them for all of the elements in the list underlying the set s. Okay, so that's a equivalent definition to the thing above. Basically, I'm kind of handling this bit here using this predicate. And well, this bit is uh, what's what's happening above here. And all kind of just, uh, well, it combines these two steps of first doing a list comprehension, which produces Booleans and then checking whether all of them are true. It combines that like into a single step. Now you can see here that there's some underlining in blue happening. And in fact, this anonymous function here can actually be represented using partial function evaluation just by typing in this. So the sort of anonymous function definition I gave before was a bit uh, overly lengthy. So remember that uh, we can partially evaluate functions. For example, I can uh, generate like a function less than or equal than four. And here, the reason I need to surround this by parentheses is because this is an infix operator. So similarly here, by putting this into infix notation, I make this into an infix operator. And so now this is like checking whether like blank is in set t, but I don't actually write the blank. So in a similar way, this partial evaluation here is like checking whether blank, so the thing I'm supplying it is less than four. So for instance, 
less than four like this in brackets five will return false but less than four three will return true because well three is actually less than four but five isn't and you can actually also do the the opposite direction so four less than so this is a like a partially evaluated function which checks whether four is less than like blank or x like the argument you're giving it so four less than three would be false whereas four less than five is true so in a similar manner here, this inset is acting like the less than operator I had before. So this is like saying, well, x is like inset t, but the x is the thing I'm supplying it, so I'm removing it here from this partial uh, evaluation. Okay, so that gives you three versions of how you could define this uh, subset function. As I said at the beginning, I think the easiest one is this one. So if you understand this, you're, you're good to go. Um, if you want, you can well think about this in terms of like a recursive definition, which is maybe a bit more basic in terms of the operations we're using there. On the other hand, the, this definition here is probably like the most compact, but it's maybe also the least clear exactly what's, what's going on there. So I would consider this version here as being like a compact rewriting of this. So probably first, if I would write the, this function myself from scratch, I would probably write something like that. And then maybe I would notice, okay, I can probably like make it a bit more compact by using all instead of and and the list comprehension. But this comes at a cost of making the code less readable. So I think uh, just sticking with this is probably also fine. Okay, so now that we have actually a way of checking whether a given set is a subset of another, I can now extend my definition of the, the data uh, type set in order to uh, implement equality checks between sets. So you'll notice here that I did not derive ek. So let's actually do that for the moment. So if I additionally derive ek in my definition of set and reload, well, then if I, let's say, check whether, uh, let's say, check whether set 1, 1 like this, uh, whether this is equal to set uh, just containing 1, you see I get false. And the reason is that, well, if I just derive ek like this, the way it checks equality is it like checks whether the underlying fields of the constructor are the same. And we know that, well, these two lists aren't actually the same, therefore this returns false. Whereas, I mean, if I add the additional element one there, it returns true because these two lists underlying sets are the same. But this is not actually the behavior we want. That's why I didn't put it in the deriving statement because in fact, we would like these two sets to be the same um, even though there's like a repeated element one in the first one. So rather we're going to define our own version of equality um, using, well, our subset function. So remember that two sets are equal. So one way of expressing that is to say that the first set is a subset of the other and conversely. Okay, and this will basically uh, be a new piece of syntax that we'll see. So I'm going to use the instance keyword. So basically I want to make uh, our new data type sets an instance of type class ek. So I want to define equality for it. And the way to do this is to type instance ek a, and then this uh, double arrow, like you do when you're adding type constraints, and then you write uh, ek, uh, and in this case, we want to do it on set a, where, and now I want to define what it means for two sets to be equal. So let's say I have two sets s and t. So s is going to be equal to t, when is that? So s equals t uh, is going to evaluate to the following thing. So on the one hand, I want s to be a subset of t. So I'm going to write s subset t. Uh, and also I want, well, t to be a uh, subset of s. Okay, and here it's suggesting this type signature, which I'll um, add just because it's trying to auto-complete it. Okay, so this piece of code might be a bit confusing, especially uh, this syntax here. So basically this is just saying, I want to create a new instance of type class ek. Well, what uh, instance is that? Well, it's going to be uh, instance for um, set a. And here I need to add ek again in front of set a. And where is like, uh, well, where is like, again, this, this where clause, but here it's a sort of, uh, Thing which allows you to then define all the functions you need in the type class. In our case, we actually only need to implement one function in order to create an instance for type class ek. We need to implement equality. So I'm now defining what it means for 
two sets to be equal. And it presupposes that I already know what it means for the, the, well, the underlying types A occurring for that set to be equal. So you can see here I'm presupposing ek A because I need ek to check whether one set is a subset of another. In any case, what I'm saying is that S equals equals T. What should that return? Well, it should return the following Boolean value. So it's going to return true precisely when both of these statements here are true, namely that S is a subset of T and also T is a subset of S. All right, so since this is the first time we're seeing this, it's not so important that you completely understand it, but it's important that you understand this definition of the equality operator here using the subset function. I can now reload and um, check whether this is actually doing what I want. So if I now, uh, well, have this comparison, so these two sets, well, they should obviously be equal, but now also if I have the repeated elements, you see that uh, this equality now returns true. And the reason is because it's exactly running this thing here. So it's checking whether this is a subset of that and conversely. And uh, well, this is the case because our subset function doesn't uh, care about repeated elements. Okay, we'll now turn to the final functions which we'll be implementing today, which are set theoretic operations of union and intersection. So here I'll give you some hints so that you can try to write these on your own. For the union, recall first that the union of two sets just combines all of the elements in both sets. And in particular, we want this process also to get rid of like duplicate elements. So like if you're unioning together the set containing one and two with the set containing one and two, you want this just to be the set containing one and two and you don't want the elements to be repeated. So the hint for implementing this function is that union is precisely list concatenation. So you're putting one list in front of another but you want to also get rid of all of the duplicate elements. And in fact, we've previously um, defined a function called toSet, which converts a list into a set and in the process gets rid of all the duplicate elements. So you can now try to uh, write your own version of union, which uh, uses this idea to implement the union of two sets. I'll now proceed to the solution. So the function I'm defining will be called union set. And it's going to take, well, two arguments of type set A and return an argument of type set A, like so. Now union set of like a set S and T, what will that be equal to? Well, the idea is I want to concatenate the underlying lists of these sets and then get rid of the duplicate elements and well, create a set from that. So one way to do this would be to, well, first get the underlying lists. So I can do unset s to get the underlying list of s, and I can do unset t to get the underlying list of t. And now remember that to concatenate these, I do the plus plus operator. So this is the concatenation operator. So this will concatenate the two uh, underlying lists of these sets. And finally, I want to convert the resulting uh, list to a set while removing duplicate elements. So that's what two set does. So I want to apply two set here to this list I obtained by concatenating the underlying lists of these sets. We can see here that there's a red squiggle. This is again because we need um, ek a in order to uh, perform the two set operation. So I need to add this uh, type constraint ek a and then the function is fine. So let's test out our new function, union set. So the first set I'm going to feed it is a set containing the elements one, two, three. And the second set I'll feed it is a set containing, let's say, one, four, five. And if I now create the union, you see it's the set containing one, two, three, four, five. So this element one has not been like uh, added twice to the resulting set, but uh, basically I'm just concatenating like these two sets and then we well, removing the duplicates to create a new set, um, which contains like no duplicates. So that's exactly what this function here is doing. Now an alternative version for this union function would have not used unset, but rather unpacked the sets in question using pattern matching. So here the set S would be of the form like it's some set which has uh, an underlying list X's and T would be a set that has underlying list Y's like this. So here X's and Y's are directly the underlying list. So I don't need to use unset. And then I replace unset S here just with the X's so that's the underlying list of S, and I replace unset T with the Y's, that's the underlying list of uh, the, the set T. 
And this uh, definition is equivalent to the one above. I've removed unset and I've replaced it by this unpacking using pattern matching. So that's also a valid version of this function that works just the same way. Okay, so union uh, was pretty simple once you realize that basically union is just concatenation of underlying lists together with removing the elements. So intersection is a bit different. So uh, intersection, uh, you can't just use an existing list operation like concatenation. I mean, there might actually be a function which does sort of intersections on lists, but I think here it's best to just like uh, write that sort of thing from scratch. So remember that the intersection of two sets are precisely the elements that occur in both sets. So we want to create somehow a list of elements that occur in both sets, and then we want to convert that thing to a set. So that's the idea behind the function. Now as an additional hint, you can notice that, well, the intersection will be a subset of, well, either one of the sets. So it's sufficient to just like take all of the elements, let's say in the first set and check whether they occur in the second set. And well, those that do, those are the ones you want to include in the intersection. So this type of procedure already kind of sounds like you're going to be doing a list comprehension. And that's what I would suggest you use here to try to write this function on your own. Okay, so I suggest now that you try to write your own implementation of intersection based on the functions we've already um, established so far. I'm now going to proceed to, well, my version. So I'm going to call this uh, intersect uh, set like this. And well, it's going to take again a set A and a second set A and produce a set A like so. And intersect set will basically be a list comprehension. So I'm going to uh, again give it two sets S and T. And what am I going to return? Well, first I'm going to generate like a list of all the elements of S that also occur in T. And I'm going to do this using a list comprehension as follows. So I want to range over all elements X which lie in the set S, okay? But again, I can't just write like X ranging over S because S here is a set and it's not a list. So I need to first unset S in order to be able to do this. So X here will now range over all of the elements in the underlying list of S. And well, basically I want to just include uh, the elements uh, into my uh, resulting list, but I want to check a certain condition. And that's exactly the condition for the intersection, namely that I only want to include those X's which also are an element of T. So here, remember in list comprehensions, I can include a predicate. Uh, so these uh, predicates are separated by commas. So here I'm now adding the, the predicate X inset T uh, in, as a condition that I'm uh, checking these elements X against. So what this is now doing is it's ranging over all of the elements X in the underlying list of S and it's checking whether, well, X is inset T. And if it's not, it'll just skip that element. And if it is, it'll, well, perform whatever operation I put here on that element. But here the operation I'm performing is just to include it in the list. Okay, and now you see it's still underlined in red. And the reason is, well, this thing here now produces a list rather than a set. And I want to actually output a set. So I need to now convert this list here into a set uh, before like outputting it. Okay, so now almost everything is fine, except that the inset here is underlying in red. And uh, this again has to do with ek A. So inset needs uh, the uh, type A to be of the ek type class. So we need to add that as a type constraint here. Okay, doke. Now you might be wondering whether it's necessary to like um, use maybe two set here rather than just like construct a set using the set constructor, because two set would in principle also remove like duplicate elements. So that would be uh, also a perfectly fine solution. But here in this case, when you're doing an intersection and you start with sets that don't have any duplicates, the result actually won't have any duplicates as well. Okay, so let's check our uh, function here. So I'm reloading after saving the script. And we can now try to get the intersection maybe of these sets I had before. So we had the set one, two, three and set um, one, four, five. So if I intersect these two sets, I should just get a set containing one. So that's correct. If I add some additional elements here, which are shared in common, I will get all the common elements. Regarding the duplicate elements, so if I have some duplicate elements here occurring in the set I'm constructing, then also the intersection will contain those duplicate elements. 
So perhaps it would be maybe better even to like to be safe to always run two set uh, instead of just constructing a set based on the list that I'm outputting because then if I if I do that then I uh, actually uh, get rid of the duplicates if my original sets had duplicates. But basically the way to probably operate with this data type is never to just construct sets using the set constructor directly, but rather always to uh, use to set, which converts the thing into a representation which doesn't have any duplicates. So yeah, we should probably use to set rather than set when we're creating new sets from scratch. Okay, so that concludes what I wanted to cover in this video. So I hope you've had some fun uh, trying to implement these various functions. And I hope that you've also learned maybe some more general background knowledge on how types work in Haskell, so how we can write new types with uh, these type parameters, um, as well as how you could maybe uh, define your own version of equality for a, a new type you're defining by creating an instance of a type class. And I also hope that this has been a nice review for you of some of the previous things we've seen, like list comprehension, um, the functions for lists like concatenation, and also these Boolean functions like AND and ALL.